It was great to see you, Anna and Maria, and uh, everyone who is joining us uh, both in Zoom to probably have a less formal discussion. Also, people who are watching uh, our session uh, tonight on Facebook. My name is Sergei Lubimo. I'm working at the European Humanities University Laboratory of Critical Urbanism. It's, I'm really intrigued and, and inspired to present our uh, today's speakers. This is uh, artist talk. Uh, delivered by a very interesting duo, Maria Nemchenka and uh, Anna Tudosh. Uh, both are uh, artists. Uh, Maria, uh, Anna is also curator. Both are connected to Glasgow uh, in Scotland. Maria Nemchenka is primarily a visual artist, educational activities facilitator, writer, and also a combat sports athlete working between Lithuania and Scotland. She received her degree from Glasgow School of Art in 2016 and also uh, in sculpture from uh, Camberwell College of Arts in 2013. In her practice, she draws from personal experience of migrant and subsequent uh, cultural assimilation to the UK. She uses photography, film, uh, text, stickers, glitter, newspaper hacking, public speaking and other less traditional approaches. She subverts and reclaims the meaning of cultural stereotypes, of which the most historically popular one to her seems to be the ones connected to other cultures' eating habits. And uh, as with eating, so with sport, she, uh, Maria aims to challenge the popular stereotypes applied to it in her life, and more recently in art, she uses combat sports from woman perspective uh, to encourage learning, challenging, and strengthening one's body, mind, and relation to society. Uh, this is Anna Nemchenka and, oh, sorry, Maria Nemchenka and uh, Anna Tudor. She's a curator and researchers, uh, a researcher based between Glasgow, UK, and Budapest, Hungary. Uh, she attended Hungarian University of Fine Arts and uh, graduated uh, uh, in a curatorial practice uh, course in uh, at the Glasgow School of Art. Her professional interests relate to uh, intangible heritage of modernist architecture including prefabricated housing, public space, and experimental playground structures. In her work with young people, she investigates the societal impact of new technology, specifically artificial intelligence, and the favors collaborative curatorial and artistic methodologies and uh, processes that are illustrated in her projects developed with Brut, Roundabout Collective, Bureau Imaginev, C3 Foundation and, and Goethe Institute. So I'm just uh, saying again that the, today's uh, title is uh, our stadium. So I'm muting my microphone. Uh, Anna and Maria, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sergei. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome uh, to the Brut uh, lecture of this afternoon. Uh, like. Uh, it was mentioned in my bio, um, I do enjoy working collaboratively and uh, this, will, this will be a very uh, collaborative talk. We'll uh, both uh, say a few sentences, but first let me start by sharing my, our presentation. Perfect, so we are Brute Collective. Um, our lecture today will uh, kind of start with our introduction, uh, just a little bit about what we've been up to and um, yeah, what our practice includes. Then we will talk a little about why we're interested in the right to public space, the right to bodily movement. Uh, we'll also discuss how sports architecture developed and what kind of um, what kind of ideology did it follow in the USSR? We'll screen a film that connects to this topic, which will be a really like short film, 20, 15, 20 minutes. Uh, and then to, uh, towards the end of the lecture, we will um, discuss what this means in the urban context. And the last thing is sort of like connected our presence in Visaginas uh, and what we're planning for the workshop in the summer school there. So I'll hand over to Maria. Oh, I think. Oh, All right. Okay, Leslie, we're here. <laughs> Hi. Um, so now we'll kind of go over who we are and what we work with and what our work, what our works has been, have been. So Brute Collective is an international project run by myself, um, Lithuanian artist Maria Nemchenko, and Hungarian curator Anna Tudos. We both met in Glasgow. Uh, we've been working together since 2018 when we organized our first event, Brute Europe. 
Um, so it was a day's conference and a day of various events that revolved around post-war housing and involved creators actively working with such heritage. So for example, we included uh, photographer Chris Leslie, who is from Glasgow and was working with the infamous Red Road blocks in Glasgow who were to be demolished. So he kind of um, documented the demolition process really beautifully. Um, in his book, Disappearing Glasgow, uh, as well as Parbo Arboleda, he was discussing contemporary uses of modernist ruins in Italy and their repurposing in the current context, as well as Owen Hatherley, who is probably a kind of a more well-known name around the um, architecture circles, who uh, works as a critical theorist in the modernist architecture, architectural context. And in our conference, he contextualized Glasgow's high rises in the wider Eastern and Western European context. So this event was a proof that there is a need for modernist housing architecture to be handled with great sensitivity, relatability and care, which is kind of the opposite to, uh, to the popular beliefs. And we turned our attention towards the high rises as places of identity formation, communality and well-being. So for us, it was a both a personal and political matter in a way that we both grew up in uh, this kind of environment and in Glasgow, we're still surrounded by these buildings and the communities from them. So out of these kind of our person, uh, out of conversations about our personal memories, playground architecture, prefabricated color theory, demolitions versus renovation, among others, a book titled Brood Boredom, High Rises, Emptiness and Play was born. This book delved into complexities of brutalist architecture, housing solutions and public spaces as they exist in different cities across Europe. So the four writers addressed the aspects of architectural heritage, preservation, progress, gentrification and exotification of the concrete estates through the written works, which follow each other as a dialogue, each having a connecting link to the previous text. Oh yeah, so in the title, boredom was used uh, in a broader context and we really wanted to make a point of this because we understood boredom as a productive, creative state connected to play and experimentation, uh, but also to leisure and to emptiness in a way. So it was a very multifaceted term for us. Uh, this boredom hints towards the feeling often present in high-rise districts, sadly due to the lack of public facilities. Yet it also derives from a personal memory of Maria being in the yard from morning to night with not much to do sitting at these uh, huts and just like spitting sunflower <laughs> seeds and chatting away. Uh, so we wanted to capture one of these like mundane yet positive moments that make much of what we experience in these high rise districts. So the book touched upon how modernist ideas and these experiences in prefabricated housing is something widely common in the international context, but somehow the local experiences never seem to fit into a bigger whole, never really form a network of solidarity. So driven by this, we decided to go on tour with the book and we organized a big variety of events kind of smaller scale. Uh, for example, this is a TV lecture in a gallery in Kaunas. Uh, we did screen printing workshops in the outskirts of Glasgow with children and screened a film in a community center. Um, so we were trying to like solidify our momentarily collaboration um, by turning it into this constantly evolving, shifting, long-term project. And I guess the last activity uh, that we were like heavily involved in was uh, last summer when we spent some time working with a local organization called Station Urbaner Kulturen in the Hellersdorf area uh, on the outskirts of Berlin. We were thinking about the ruins in public spaces and their possible functions, heritage, and the role of artists in the thinking process as well. We were kind of um, inspired by this quote by Edward Hollis, which was also in the Brute Boredom book. He said, ruins could be built rather than buildings ruined. So following his uh, train of thought, we commissioned four writers uh, from Hellersdorf, 
from a distance because obviously we couldn't travel to Berlin, who uh, wrote to us about their favorite local ruins. And uh, out of these kind of um, imaginary slash real images, uh, we combined together a poster, uh, a billboard. For example, here, uh, the local pool, a former public pool, uh, or a basketball pitch that, you know, stayed strong in people's memories, but, um, but it kind of didn't really make it into the regeneration plans. And they take good care in like, thinking through how the gener generation processes will be. But still, these areas kind of remained a little forgotten about. Um, so it was clear that there was uh, what was lacking in one of the most, uh, most densely populated neighborhoods in Berlin was accessible public space for community sports, movement, physical activities and play something that quite a few of these former places uh, managed to offer before. And uh, this has inevitably led us to think uh, of public space for physical activity uh, that not only has an effect on people's well-being, but makes them a stronger community altogether. Um, so many places that we visited throughout our tour um, had problems uh, with accessible public space that was turned into car parking, was outdated or contained only very small and boring playgrounds to which some people like to refer as the Euro uh, renovations that lack any form of creativity. And I guess for um, some of us that are from, for instance, Lithuania or other um, countries that undergone Euro renovations, I guess you all have seen these uh, quite small playgrounds that are quite identical a lot of the time uh, too. So, <clears throat> however, there were uh, clear signs of people wanting to also reclaim the public space. And uh, we witnessed some DOI facilities or spaces that were offering that. And some of them were results of organization that worked with the neighborhood and some were initiatives led purely by the inhabitants themselves. So a few examples of that are Shalania Urban Gardens in Konos, led by um, artist and um, kind of social worker Evelina Shimkuta and her Shalini project in uh, Shalini Micro District, as well as makeshift public art out of remaining concrete blocks of old benches and tables in Budapest. Um, as well as a cricket field in Hellersdorf set up by refugees in order to bring people from different backgrounds closer together by sports. And this was actually maybe slightly like a breaking point that made us really interested in sports as a tool for uh, community work and community and public space connectivity. So currently we are interested in how body movement, sports and urban areas that allow for, so, allow for such activities affect our mental and physical health. Hence through our research activities and experiments in art, architecture and sports, we focus upon available time spent together in the open air. So currently we're preparing a summer non-school program for young people living in the peripheral areas of Glasgow, where we will address examples of public space that promote movement and sports. And here in the image is the poster, kind of like an open call for, the, uh, for young people to apply to the uh, summer school, as well as two kind of research posters that we saw if we're creating for ourselves. Um, so together with the young people, we will aim to imagine a stadium as a democratic space where anybody can play, move, do exercise, observe, or just rest. We are both amateur athletes as well as creative practitioners, and we see the importance of having access to sporting venues a lot. Whether in Budapest or in Vilnius, we channeled a lot of our excess energy into sports, and the city is a determining context for that. It really makes a difference where they can spend time in the open air, especially when it was um, during the COVID context, um, whether you have a park or a stadium to run in, a pitch to kick a ball, or just a ping pong table to meet your friends at. 
Yeah, so basically during the programming of this uh, summer school for young people, uh, we conducted a research to have a general understanding of sports in the urban context. So we investiga investigated how sports was historically represented and exercised in various cities. And we particularly focused upon the construction of the modern city, uh, modernism and the role of sports and architecture and society. So I guess we will go a little bit into that as it strongly connects to the ideas um, that inspire our work for Visa Guinness as well. Um, so a crucial part of modernist life reform movements from the 1880s was promoting development of mind and body, opposing a monotonous lifestyle present in industrial work. The first modern Olymp Olympic Games in 19, uh, uh, sorry, 1896 were a huge milestone setting up a trend and the need for sports infrastructure from training grounds to funding. From the 1920s, the architecture of sports and outdoor play as well has been developing hand in hand with urban planning. Modernist ideas separating work from leisure gain importance and maybe you're familiar with Le Corbusier's plan uh, for the radiant city, which from the beginning kind of imagined the uh, prefabricated buildings in coexistence with green areas. Uh, so you can kind of see how designated areas and buildings were assigned to each. City planning was strongly connected to regulating bodies as well, uh, in the Foucauldian sense, especially if we take the Soviet Union as a primary, primarily example, which is our case. Biopolitics claimed that the body, or biological visceral functioning, is a construction by those in power and that there is no such thing as an apolitical body. This is not necessarily about the state deciding on life or death matters, but uh, more the ability, ability to control and utilize life. The Soviet project was parad paradigmatically biopolitical in its ambition to transform the forms of life of the population in line with the communist ideology. This was just as noticeable in con controlled urban developments as in the increasing social role of sports. Amongst many other sports present, Modern gymnastics was utilized with the specific purpose of, yet, of getting young men in the best possible physical condition and spirits for possible military encounters. So in the 1920s, the Soviet Union largely opted out of the Western system of international sport, condemning, condemning it as inherently capitalistic and individualistic. Competition was originally viewed as a capitalist construction by many, dividing the opinion of the role of sports in the Soviet society. Instead, the Soviet Union attempted to build an alternative international system based on a distinctly proletariat brand of sport and physical culture that eschewed individualism and record seeking. Piotr Lesgaft, the founder of a scientific system of fitness education at the end of the 19th century in Russia, advocated a pedagogical approach to physical education, recommending a system of exercises, both for school and the home. He took part in the Society for Encouragement of Physical Development. It was a philanthropic organization that constructed play areas in a number of towns, and provided sports amenities for poor children, arranging team games, camps, and excursions for them, as well as boating in summer and ice skating and sledging in winter. According to him, games were meant to encourage a group spirit, unselfishness, social awareness, and a sense of being in a larger whole. A quote by him, games arose and gradually developed social instincts. In every school game, the player is a member of a small society, actively participating in it, forgetting about his personal selfish aims and engrossed exclusive, exclusively in the attainment of common aims, all the while adhering to all the accepted principles and laws that restrict the rights of every individual. It is interesting to think about this in relation to football and football spaces in the former Soviet Union too, 
Much later, after Lasgap's pioneering activities, a Hungarian football coach, Gustav Sebes, who was lead Hungarian football team to Helsinki's Olympic victory in uh, 1952, and made the Hungarian team the best uh, team in the world. So he employed the style of play known as socialist football. <laughs> um, so it was basically an idea that with every team member working for the entire unit and no individuals taking precedence, you can kind of set the example of socialist football. A quote by him as well. So. He genuinely believed that if football follows socialism, a better, more egalitarian, more beautiful type of play would be achieved. However, despite fluid teamwork, every individual had to continuously improve their physical abilities, meaning that there had to be an infrastructure to grow not only physically talented, but also unselfish, socially aware, active and dev devoted players and their supporters. So, football was a sport that could employ the collective logic and portray what Potter described as a sense of justice, of camaraderie, of fair play, and acquaintance with public opinion. These are all given to us by games. Are not these the feelings we wish our children to possess, both as future citizens and as useful and active members of society? In the era after Stalin, especially during the Cold War, the competition between nations easily spiraled into the world of sports too. Sport provided distraction from national problems and an ongoing evidence, evidence of Soviet supremacy. Yet it is worth to note that historically arenas and stadiums were actually built for the purposes of distraction and entertainment. Already at the Gladiator Games, the arena was used to divert society's attention from political events. During the Cold War, and perhaps even now, sports venues were somehow equivalent to arenas where an ideal society was performed. The Soviet so-called sports workers were touring around the world, presenting their physical abilities or formations at mass ceremonies, um, and were being told to conceal the difficulty of the exercise they performed. Smile, otherwise the spectator will see how hard you are working and the illusion will be lost. A coach has told a Belarusian gymnast star Olga Korbut. And here is an image of um, Olga crying at the Olympic Games, which kind of sent shocks to the world after she stumbled during, um, during her routine. Um, so it was very unusual to everyone for everyone to see. So at the same time, uh, the Soviet Union was also the country that built the most prefabricated or high-rise housing blocks in the whole world. By the end of the regime in 91, industrialized, industrialized housing made up 75% of all of Soviet housing stock. However, at least idealistically, these districts were not meant to be singular houses, but rather a part of an infrastructure uniting living, recreational and community facilities. Since sports culture was part of the political system, perhaps there wasn't a country or a union of countries that paid so much attention to sports as the Soviet Union. And this is why we looked at the former Soviet Union the most as well. Having a political agenda behind excelling at sports resulted in the increasing planning for sports architecture. Apart from preparing athletes, sport was meant to offer a chance for mindfulness, competition, and positive collective experiences to ordinary people. What was known as the All Union Physical Culture Complex was split into two parts called Masovost, Massness, and Masterswo, Proficiency. So in order to find talented athletes, a must structure for physical education has to be put in place in the first place. So without Masofost, there wouldn't be masters, so basically. In the words of Mikhail Kalinin, a former chairman of the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet of the USSR, in our country, physical culture is sport for the people. In our country, millions participate in the physical culture movement, and it is obvious that talented athletes will sooner be found amongst these millions than amongst thousands. 
Yet, it is interesting to note that being an athlete was not a professional job. It was a secondary preoccupation amongst an already existing job somewhere. So thanks, for example, if there was a cement factory, they would have workers who would, who would also have their own football team and they would kind of, with the football team, they would be going to the um, games um, nationally or within the Soviet so, um, territory. So being a worker has also meant being an athlete. And this is perfectly illustrated in this image by Friedrich Kiesler. Alertness, vigor, virility, and a trained, able body was fundamental, fundamental to the proletariat culture and society. Here, work tools could be easily replaced by the sport or even play tools which is also intriguing to consider when thinking of play spaces for children in the former Soviet countries. And this image is really interesting because you could um, directly see how this kind of uh, work tools of uh, kind of rural context or industrialized context too uh, um, was sort of being replaced by a variety of sports and there's a clear relevance between them and a link. It comes then as no surprise that sporting venues were part of working venues, part of one architectural and ideological unit with factories owning football pitches, sports halls, and so on. As it was mentioned before, mass participation in sport was assumed to be necessary not only to secure a maximum pool of talent, but also to have fit and strong people for potential military purposes. Most of the sports societies were governed by trade unions and often were closely associated with a certain ministry. This could be the police, aircraft, woodworkers, tractor industry, but even the KGB or the Red Army. These industries were all being state funded. 25 million athletes in the USSR were members of sports societies in the 1970s. But also, for instance, in Romania, Football was one of the main sports to be undertaken by the workers of various industries. In Bucharest, uh, these that what could be defined as uh, worker stadiums were dotted all over the city. There was uh, Greta Factory's Revista Stadium that was not only one of the best places to play football, but also one of the key places in the neighborhood. Electromagnetica, which was used by the factory's home team Metatool as well as Rapid Bucharest, the railway company club. And then there was Electro Aparatai with their uh, complex called uh, 23rd of August, exactly. You can see on the picture. And uh, this was supposed to be uh, the most acclaimed sports infrastructure developed by the freshly installed communist regime. Its long-term objective was reshaping Bucharest development and transforming it into a socialist city one, where sports was accessible for all in order to create a new and healthy working class meant to enthusiastically build communism, among many, many others. So just to note, uh, some of the stadiums in Romania are very, very nicely documented uh, by a project aimed to preserve uh, the sports football history. So if you follow this link, you will find a lot more information. So a similar setup of accessible sporting grounds for players and spectators connected to a cement factory will be visible in the film that we are about to show too. And the action takes place in a small town of Lithuania called Nojojak Manor. And perhaps it's not so different from the Saginas in a, um, on a, in the, yeah. <laughs> Um, so yeah, let's watch see. the <laughs> let's watch the film. It takes uh, it lasts for around twenty minutes, twenty one minutes to be exact, and um, it follows this little boy Virginius and his take on the New Liban industry and the connected uh, football grounds. Just bear with me for a second until I change the screen.
turė suspėti žmonės. Greitai sproks. Suspės nubėgti. Į pratę. Matai, viskas tvarkoj, o tu bijojai. Dabar šį sklinčių akmo keliausi cemento gamyklą. Ją prieš dešimt metų pastatėjai apleistame užkampyje. Gretimai išaugo cementininkų miestelis naujoji akmenį, kuriame ir gyvena šis berniukas, Virginijus. Jis turi daug pažįstamų, visi jį čia žinu. Naujoji akmenį gerbė kiekvieną puikų žmogų, nors jam būtų tik devyneri metai. Kiek kartų įskaičiavo tos virbus? Pašaliniams draudžiama. Na, bet jis ar pašalinis? Čia gydirba jo tėvas, meistras matas. Senė jau svajoja Virginijus patekti į gamyklą, pažiūrėti, kas ten viduje. Palūkėk, greit paleis ketvirtąją liniją, užventi, tada ir pamatysi. Čia kirti kirti, palaukau lužauksi, palaukau krosnį paleis. Greitai, Virginijau. Dabar jau greit. Nauja krosnis, nauja kalnai cemento. Tai esi gytas, mano mažasis broliukas. Aš jį aukliai. Ką atvien? Neleidžiu nujaukiu. Tai priepė mama. Jie išaugo šiame mieste, kuris vis kyla juokysia. Kuomet gimė Virginijus, čia stovėjo tik keletas namų. O dabar gatvių nebesuskaityys. Ir kiekvieną mėnesį atsiranda kas tors naujo. Neveltų juk miestas vadinamas naujoji akmenį. Tai jų pasaulis, kur visi dirba, vienas kitam padeda, giliojantis pasaulis, kupinas halisio, įvairiausių įvykių. Vakar jie sužinojo, kad naujame name gaus būta. Kažkur čia, o galbūt šalia. Ir atėjo pažiūrėti.
dabar jie gyvena pačiame centre – Leninų Latvija. Namas neblogas, tik keturiems viename kambarje – Ankštoka. Gal todėl ir nesinori sėdėti namuose. Dabar tai jau jie nuspręs, kam pirma skristi į kosmosą. Virginijaus, jo bičiulio Edmundo, gamyklos direktojo spūdulio ir daugelio daugelio kmeniečių didžiausia įstra, futbulas. Jie myli savo cementininko komandą, didžiuojasi, kad jie iškovojo tieso staurę. Bet šiandien žaidimui kažkur tai stinga, žaidžia tingėdami nuo bodų stebint tokias rungtynės užmygti galima. Gal futbolistė neįsimėgojo? Apsipalkė? Geriau jau būčiau nes į sodą. Tai kolektyvinis sodas. Kiekvienas akmenėtis pasodino čia medį ar krūmą. Atrodo žaidinė įvyko persilaudžimas. Taip. Yra. Nieko nepadarysi, cementininko stadione daugelis varžovų skeščia į rankomis. Už auksiu irgi žaisiu už cementininką. Ir mušiu įvartį po įvarčią. Kas netrokšta išgarsinti gimto miestą? Sigitas tiki savo vyresniuoju broliu. Ir pasiruošęs dėl jo pereiti per ugnį ir vandenį. Sigitas dar už mane blogiau plaukė. Kartavos vonė neprigėlė. Kelis mūsų mėste visai nemoka plaukti. Tai ir vaikštėt nesinai tai išmoko. O kas, jeigu tapti plaukimo čempionu? Sigito neapgausi, jis žino, kaip laukia Virginijas. Žinoma, būtų labai malonu išgirsti pasaulio čempionas Virginijus iš naujosios akmenės. Virginijaus talentas išriškėjo kitur. Akmeniečių tarpė jis jau ir dabar žinomas žmogus. Įžymesnis, 
neįsigitas. Aktas sigėtas vis atnelaiku. Tu jie dainuoja apie savo miestelį. Nors jis ir mažas, bet juk naujosios akmenės cementas teikia gyvybę naujiems didelėms miestams. Ir gyvenimas čia virte verda kaip ir stambiausiame mieste. Nespėjau pagaminti pietus, užsigitas už žmygų. Mes su tėčiu buvome čia ir anksčiau. Kalba artimiausių mėdinomis paleis nauja krosnių. Jau tvarko gamyklos teritorija. Sutartinai, Kaip visada. Taip sutartinai statė jie ir miestą, ir gamyklą, ir stadioną, ir baseiną. Visa respublika žino, kad nauja akmeniečiai komunistinio darbo kolektyvas.
Oi, o cachorro que eu não viu, só com nada. Ateio, não ios, linios, palei de modiana. Teva se esteceu, Jodi. Virgínios pagalhau pateco gamiclo. Lietuvos kamikla duas du kart daugiau cemento. Bet jau tai dėdė ir nulionis. O su kaimynas. O aš vis galvoju, kas gyvaldo grosnį. O kokie auginys. Ir dėdė kiūdalas čia. Tais mane mokė plaukti. Kiek čia įvairiausių prieto esu. Aš iš karto viską supainečiau. Tata Monika. Mes su jie viename chorį dainuojame. Cementas. Koks nuostabus? Dėdė Čiapas? Taip, dėdė Čiapas ir gigamina cementą. Ir galbūt nežymiu dainininkų, ne čempionų tapsi tu virginijau, o pačiu garbingiausių žmogumi žemėje. Darbininkų, kuris sukūrė viską ir šią gamyklą, ir mašinas.
que ela volta. Nenosimenk, Virginia. Darbus daug sprogimų, taikių sprogimų, skelbiančių naują gyvenimą. Ir dar daug gero naujai atmeniai padarysi ir tu. Hi, sorry about the constant pauses. It was probably a glitch in our uh, connection, but I hope you enjoyed this film. It's uh, definitely not your typical propaganda film. Uh, go back to your presentation, actually, if you bear with us for a little more. There we go. Right. So, as we can see that in the um, 1960s, life pretty much revolved around work and structured leisure, whether that was sports or uh, cultural activities, it was pretty much structured within um, the city's infrastructure as well. Um, however, although <laughs> no matter how beautiful this propaganda film is, it's still a propaganda film and it wasn't always um, reflecting the reality and uh, especially with cities getting bigger and bigger and bigger in the second half of the uh, 20th century, resources running out um, and in some places plans for the built environment weren't really realized in this kind of utopian way that they were meant that they were originally imagined. Um, however, in Vosagina's case, it was it was pretty, it pretty much was. So it's kind of a different uh, case scenario, I guess. Um, and socialist prosperity was questioned more and more until its eventual breaking point in the 90s. And this documentary is quite unique because it already shows some signs of uh, kind of like uh, subtle criticality and also like through the um, lens of a child or through the mind of a child. Uh, many people are even more so critical about the concrete blocks of flats uh, populating our cities all over Europe too. And even if Prefabricated housing originates from France. It is strongly associated with Soviet states, often in reductive and simplified way. So, um, but the way to understand how they could become so common is to look at them simply as a cheap and fast way to provide better quality housing for the masses than the slums or the streets. And to solve the housing crisis that emerged due to the growing population, growing cities and growing industrialization. As Owen Hatherley wrote in the introduction to the Bruick Boredom book, the need really was urgent. After the carnage of Stalinist industrialization and then the total devastation of the Great Patriotic War, millions of people were effectively homeless. They wanted to get rid of the slums and get people into housing that didn't leak, that had indoor toilets, central heating and space, and they wanted to do it now. When looking at the Komia blocks, whether in France, Lithuania, Hungary and Scotland, it occurs to me that they are ideal for two specific historical moments. The 1950s, before consumerism and the ideology of choice had really become dominant and poverty was ubiquitous and raw. And maybe unexpectedly, the present. Most people under 40s have to cope with the broken housing system, insecure employment, and the punitive remnant, remnants of the post-welfare state. In these high-rise or commie block areas, the role of public space is higher than anywhere else. And maybe this is something that already was visible in the film. Um, uh, it is important for those inhabitants to have some place to move, a uh, breath of fresh air, um, gather, play games and so on. Like the boy in the film was saying, or oh, maybe people leave the flats to play because four uh, people in one room is a bit crammed. Um, I don't know, I've definitely been in uh, uh, home sharing situations where with a lot of flatmates it was uh, quite difficult and especially now with the pandemic I guess it's uh, another uh, 
another context where it's quite important to have access to good quality public space. And I guess this is especially young, true for young people. Um, uh, an example you can see um, from another residency in Topolcán in Slovakia. It is in many former uh, Soviet Union countries that we see solutions that were put in place to compensate for the lack of these private uh, lack of private space. Districts being built in green areas or surrounded by greenery, community canteens, cultural centers, port centers established to preoccupy people post work or school, many of which are currently under threat. Overall sports culture has had a presence that is hard to comprehend at present back then. According to some of the people interviewed in Visaginas actually, there was hardly anyone who didn't take up some kind of sports or physical activity. Kids were not only encouraged to move through play or, and sports spaces, but they were surrounded by exercising parents or being observed by the elderly. We once go back uh, again to the example of Giruata's Ravista Stadium that you can see on the slide. Um, it was not only a sporting ground, but kind of a multifunctional space. Um, we see that their kids could play and watch, uh, and their parents could watch them, or they could even watch their parents undertake any sporting activity through this kind of setting a positive example. So it was really like a part of the city's fabric. Um, in the article, The Unfortunate Presence of Bucharest Worker Stadiums by Andrei Mihail, he describes Revista as um, it was more of a freeware sporting center than a plain stadium. Although owned by one of the most important factories in town, it was also accessible for those who wanted to spend time outdoors. Children played football or handball on the training fields. Others picnicked in the grass covered areas of the arena. The elderly son bathed amongst the stands during summer days right next to youngsters who played chess and backgammon in the shade of trees. So political systems had changed, leaving prefabricated housing blocks and the public space that such estates offer somehow in limbo. Many of the worker stadiums became a faint memory. In many of the estates, as well as stadiums, at best the spaces had a minimal upkeep, at worst a total decay and privatization of public facilities has happened. Spaces that offer open access to sports, or offer the chance to build something ourselves, modify it freely. Like for example, to build a gym, a DIY gym are not that uncommon. Um, so here, for, for instance, there's a DOI uh, gym in Vingis Park in Vilnius, where, as you can see, it's pretty much built out of wood and sort of uh, recycled materials and tires and stuff. And it's all the time really busy with people. There's all the time someone working out and it's just quite great um, accessible facility for many. So the features as the features as described by Andre Mikhail are very much lacking from any modern day sporting facilities, let alone stadiums or arenas. One of the biggest obstacles in accessing sports and appropriate equipment on a popular level now is the, now is the privatization of sports. Many current stadiums that could offer a football pitch or a running track are open for members only or only at certain times or they belong to a school posing difficulties to individual access. As one friend noted in our conversation um, about sporting grounds in Vilnius, so he said that I used to play football before, but now there's nowhere to play, literally. Pitches are either closed down or made private or they belong to schools and, you, and got completely fenced off, so you can't really access them either. So I had to transition to bas basketball, even if I don't really like it that much. Um, and for, for instance, the use of Vingis Park Stadium in Vilnius costs three euros per use. So that's if you want to run, for instance, track, then you have to pay three euros, uh, making it quite inaccessible to people below average wage. As a physical marker symbolizing exclusion, there's often a fence surrounding the stadiums and separating them from the city's infrastructure, almost as if saying that sport is no longer public. 
this very uh, apparent lack of non-commercial sporting facilities and spaces, not only in neighborhoods, but also kind of like on a general level, is perhaps partly due to the changing nature of how we participate in sports and what it means in the contemporary digital society as well. Um, we no longer go to the stadium only for sports, but rather to consume and to be entertained. Um, so we kind of wanted to go back to the idea of an arena as a space um, that is not necessarily only for distraction. Um, and yeah, we kind of want to imagine a stadium that you don't only go to to live in it in like a consumer sense. Uh, this is maybe, uh, an, you know, not very visible on this particular image, but uh, when you imagine a stadium, uh, you imagine the stadiums that have kind of become digital in the way that they have facial recognition cameras, every moment is televised with the help of massive recording systems and uh, you're kind of uh, consuming the image of the game almost through your own individualized screens as well. So this is obviously moving very far from the community driven sports, spirit, facilities and approach. Uh, perhaps even uh, the meaning of sports on a mass level as well. Uh, Michnea Antila in her article Minor Football wrote uh, in the book Corner uh, Football and Society. Uh, yeah, she basically describes the current state of football grounds and proposes an alternative as well to uh, amateur minority or community run clubs. So I thought it's a nice quote. I'll just read it to you. To be frank, football today is a mirror of neoliberal ideology a totalizing, ideologized and ideologizing machinery, rigidly stratified, football being exclusively as a commodified element. Stadiums of modern football, these small cathedrals in which bodies are seen exclusively as consumers, passive consumers, parts of an underlining libidinal economy, face the alternative of open assemblages, horizontally and democratically organized, in which bodies fulfill active functions, forming collective organism, including the fans, which is nevertheless heterogeneous and diverse. Yet, lo <clears throat> yet local community sports clubs, such as the volunteer-based Vilnius Social Football Club, uh, called Vilnius Social, uh, provide opportunities for children to train and perfect the technique but also learn about working together, the responsibilities that come with managing a group, as well as sportsmanship and fair play. This loosely organized bottom-up format differs from the centralized sports clubs in the USSR, but perhaps it goes back to the initial idea suggested by Potter Lesgaf, where sport is focused less on competitiveness and more on team spirit, fun and experience, where sport and its facilities are spaces where people meet socialized and interact with other groups. These are the spaces integral to communities and neighborhoods, being the glue that strengthens them. In Visaginas, where the post-nuclear urbanist summer school takes place, sport has been high on the agenda for many decade, decades. We became interested in this town as we were looking into places of significant sports histories in the post-Soviet arenas too. Visaginas became known as the strongest acrobatics training place in the USSR. It prepared many Olympic champions and was a great point of attraction for this reason too. Besides this, Visaginas excelled at football, rowing, wrestling, hockey and boxing. We also became intrigued about the post-nuclear nature, na nature of the town and began thinking about how energy and identity were transformed parallel in this case. And here's the image of um, how Visaginas, um, this four kind of sporting, free accessible sporting grounds look like with um, hockey, uh, tennis, tennis, uh, basketball, and I think football. And um, after all, as Violeta Sekai, a former middle distance runner from Romania said about access to sporting facilities. And so younger generations are deprived of places where they could consume their energy. 
Another thing we are kind of interested to explore in the context of Visaginas is that a lot for a lot of us, sports is uh, almost fully an individual responsibility and has more to do with a healthy lifestyle than national pride. Um, you can see my uh, Strava stats here on this picture, and uh, I can say that it is the case for me for sure. Um, and you, you know, accordingly to this um, to this um, notion, the spaces of sports have also changed significantly. Uh, the stadium isn't the space for people to come together anymore. Uh, when people are kind of like doing aerobics videos in their living rooms or recording their runs on their phone apps, uh, this shouldn't mean, however, that there isn't a, you know a need for uh, or a need for space for bottom-up initiatives and open access facilities, there is obviously, but uh, you know, we are kind of aware that adult life for most is conducted in a sitting position at a desk, just like right now. Uh, and obviously gyms can offer a way to squeeze move and movement in our daily routines again, but a lot of us are intimidated either by the gym environment or the repetitive sequences of exercises or by sort of militaristic fitness instructors shouting instructions at a class of strangers. So I think the gym is a very restricted space, not really designed for free movement um, and working out can very much resemble work in a lot of cases. So I think that, you know, it's a common alternative to the lack of publicly accessible sports grounds and commercial gyms. Um, uh, you know, the solution to this often comes in the form of personal personalizable training apps and in a way that makes the city uh, one's personal stadium. Smart cities are occupied with uh, people wearing smartwatches, counting footsteps, kilometers, tracking routes. You can see here, uh, you can even see the elevation and uh, how uh, cold the air felt like when I did this cycle ride. Um, it, uh, these apps can kind of, you know, there has also always been a self-monitoring element when it came to fitness. Uh, you measured your weight and you kind of followed your performance change. But uh, this sudden automation is kind of like a double-sided uh, double uh, thing. Um, yeah, it basically can have positive and negative effects at the same time. Uh, you can use these apps to get inspired about the ways you can move, places you can go. They can teach you mindfulness or even connect you with a community. But we also want to be wary of an overall reliance on technology and therefore kind of find a way to connect it to the here and now. So we are interested to see if there is a way to use these technologies to reimagine what a stadium can be some sort of a juxtaposition of city and body, community and play and fitness and data. So we see Avasaginas as a place where the energy surrounding sports organization and infrastructure has been very strong for decades. It is still strong today. Perhaps it is due to the rich sports history as well as the multicultural context or maybe the size of the town. The community driven approach to sporting facilities still has a presence. This presence can be hopefully activated and maintained by combining historical elements of sport in Visaginas with the present circumstances and spaces of possibility. Built on our research into stadium architecture and the social history, we will aim to create an antidote to the current idea of the sports arena. We will propose the free usage of alternative spaces for sports that can coexist with the fitness technology which has inevitably became a part of our lives. And here's the um, kind of our last image of um, uh, notice board or achievements board in the uh, School for Acrobatics in Visaginas. And here are the kind of historical achievements and so showing sort of formations and different sporting grounds and um, different athletes. Um, so our main question for our workshop in Visaginas at the end of August will be to explore the potential for technology and data to promote sport as a social and creative activity. 
as well as a tool to present local sports history accessible for a wide audience as part of the planned town state town museum excuse me <laughs> um so yeah with this note we will finish as well with this image of um achievements board thank you thanks <laughs> Great, thank you very, very much, Anna and Maria. It was really exciting uh, itinerary that you that you just uh, sketched for us and took and took us with you. I think it would be great to have at least one uh, round of uh, questions or or comments, uh, reflections. We're few on Zoom, but I saw people were commenting on Facebook. I think I'll go go there to uh, to check what's there, but. While people are still formulating questions, I could I could start I guess with uh, with my reflection. I really like how you, in the historical part of your talk, how you connected massiveness and efficiency in this notion of sports and athleticism and body and politics in Soviet regime in Soviet in Soviet context, and somehow you implied that what didn't work about it was precisely about the, the, the Soviet sport was precisely that this link between massiveness and efficiency wasn't wasn't working properly. So it was not addressed properly. So I just wonder, like right now, when thinking about athleticism and high rise and uh, collectivity, you know, what you start with from efficiency or from massiveness or, or, or you replace some of this, you critically replace some of these terms as not really valid ones by other terms, for example, not massiveness, but I don't know, empathy or, or uh, collectivity or not efficiency, but I don't know, productive boredom or, or whatever. So I just, I just wonder how you, whether, whether this, this link between massiveness and efficiency is uh, making sense for, for you today as well, or it's rather a historical reference. Sorry if it's too long. I guess, uh, if I can start from something that uh, I was speaking actually to a few. Uh, people and um, oh, is it? Yeah, I think we're frozen. Maybe we frozen. <laughs> I don't know. I think we hear you. We hear you, but maybe okay, switch, switch, so... switch, on your, switch off your camera and then switch it on again. Something like this. Okay, we'll try. Um. Yeah. So, in terms of like speaking of mass sports, I guess um, the problem with mass mass was was. Um, that it was quite a military approach to sports and a lot of people were kind of and still are traumatized by this uh, <laughs> compulsory sport and I think you know when anything is compulsory and anything is forced upon you you're not that likely to kind of you know take it freely and make it out of your own free will um, and um, I mean Talk, saying of uh, Master Stvo, I mean, at that time, there were produced, there were a lot of uh, really uh, famous athletes were produced in the Soviet Union, but obviously there was a price for that. The same was like uh, with Olga Korbut or many gymnasts that undergone like extreme um, verbal, physical and sexual abuses that were kind of part of the sort of athletic career as well as like other um athletes that just you know they were in this quite like harsh structured environment and i guess what we are interested is um how to take some certain elements from that but apply it in a more kind of accessible and collective and free will way where um like uh there was the Revista Stadium, where with the quote they were saying there was a stadium, but it was a multifunctional venue of people doing variety of activities. So I think it doesn't matter if you participate as um, as an audience, and you're not actually undertaking sport. You're doing you're being within that context. So it's also in some way participating in this um, active kind of environment. Um, mm, so yeah, I would just maybe add that for me. Um, I feel like there's a big difference between uh, competitive sports and, you know, massive sport, like for sports for the masses. And maybe, uh, you know, uh, competitive sport has evolved in a much better way, maybe, than, uh, you know, these mass facilities have, uh, if they even evolved. So I think it's just maybe 
Um, I quite like what you said about uh, the productive boredom and kind of bottom-up initiatives. Um, obviously, that's a big contrast between, you know, kind of state-funded facilities and stadiums, which are obviously very nice, but not sustainable. Um, so I think maybe the solution could be more towards in that, uh, that way. Super. I'll just, as promised, I go to quickly check uh, Facebook comments. If someone is uh, willing to share a reflection, comment, or ask a straight uh, forward question, please. I guess, uh, yeah, there are some, but uh, there are some compliments and there are uh, <laughs> questions about, about the speakers, <laughs> about the speakers that were answered already. So, so there is anything uh, additional. I, I, of course, have a range of questions and uh, we could discuss them later, of course, but I'm, I'm also, kind of... We would also encourage people if they know of, you know, interesting examples of uh, stadiums or have, you know, personal memories, uh, we can either, you know, uh, we're interested in them now or even at the summer school, so, um, you know. So for the Romanian project of this collecting, uh, the kind of archiving the, the stories of, of stadiums is, is really nice. I wonder if something like this exists in other national uh, contexts. Would be uh, great to check. It is actually an exhibition on, or maybe it has already finished, I'm not sure, at the transit in Bucharest. Um, it's exactly on these topics, I guess, coinciding with the Euros. <laughs> but um, it's also the, the exhibitions organized, I think, by the same people. They're quite like active sort of culture and uh, football fans. <laughs> yeah. so it's really nice that they kind of um, continuously upkeeping this topic and keep adding like new material and new angles to it. Yeah, we've shown an image. Oh, I've seen, I see someone raising a hand, but just quickly I'll tell. So there was an image, maybe you remember, of like an abandoned stadium overgrown with grass. It was like an aerial shot. So that's a, a stadium in Chisinau in Moldova, uh, where uh, there's uh, currently like an artistic movement to kind of raise attention on it because um, it has been a public park for many uh, years now. Uh, it has kind of lost the original uh, function, but it still kept going on as a public venue and people were using it. But now there's plans to um, build actually a US embassy attachment on the same location. And what was then on the periphery of the city now has became the centrum. So it is like a very uh, complex history, not just in terms of like sports history, but urban history as well. Um, so I guess there aren't many like extensive, you know, research uh, projects docu documenting stadiums, but also there are artistic movements that are trying to deal with them and bring it, raise attention. Works great. Uh, Serban? Uh, yeah, thank you very much for your presentation. I'm actually Romanian myself, as you might know from my emails to you. Um, I actually didn't know about that uh, database, about stadiums. That's quite a welcome site. Thank you for your presentation and your comparisons with other Eastern Bloc countries <laughs> or former Soviet republics like Lithuania. Um, my question would be, um, how do you intend to, um, how should I put this, to propagate this idea of a uh, combination between states subsidized maybe or state supported stadiums for uh, common usage and how do you how could we um let put underline this how could we convince the population and the authorities to give the much necessary support because one thing i've been observing in romania is there was this stupid ruling that uh after 2000 or something, after we got into the EU, that we couldn't use stadiums after school because there was nobody uh, supervising us because we could break windows or whatever. The other thing was no access to stadium because of vandalism. Another thing was the chronic lack of funding for stadiums, which and the wild corrupted privatization that took part. Um, just off a few of the stadiums, I can also remind you of uh, Regie, where Rapid was playing, uh, Progress Bucharest, that stadium. Uh, the 23rd of August, if I'm not mistaken, that's the National Arena right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. And 
or also because we've been following in the sports news all of those. Even in my town, they replaced it with a new arena. That's a happy place, but you cannot, you don't have free access to it. You actually have to pay for it. And if you want to play uh, 11 versus 11 in some place, uh, you either have to use a long list, long waiting list, or you have to pay like 40 euros per use. Yeah. Because yeah. it's an official training base. And it's, yeah. it's yeah. very stupid, in my opinion. I definitely agree with you. And I think that's like, um, yeah, quite, in my opinion, a difficult situation for like accessing sports freely. And um, I think you actually like in Vesaginas was, um, but I think the situation will be changing now with the um, Vilnius kind of building a new football academy in the, instead of um, Vesaginas people actually building it. Um, so the, the, the stadium there, although it was uh, gated up, it had like, um, the gate was open and like, I can go in there and sort of do my runs or whatever I need to do. And that was quite, like, it was quite nice with the whole history of the city and the sport still kind of having the significant value in it. And you actually go to a fenced off stadium, but the door is open to you. Um, so although that, you know, like, um, I guess there are members of it that kind of could use facilities in a different way that still kind of was open to public and you know like um i guess at this date <laughs> stage maybe late in the future uh we don't, <laughs> don't have like a financial plan <laughs> as per se but um but there are examples in the world that kind of function on sort of semi-public semi kind of members um basis and um or like function as charities as well, with kind of, for instance, some members paying um, minimal fees, whereas others that can't really afford um, the access, they're not like paying for it as well as, yeah, variety of funding options, which is all the time, not really the easiest way to go as well. Um, but um, yeah, I guess it has to be like a mixture of uh, kind of private and public initiatives to sustain it. In terms of how, you know, we are planning to tackle it or how, you know, other creatives could try and, you know, uh, come up with ideas to this. Um, I think, you know, you don't start with the stadiums. They have become kind of like monstrous and uh, <laughs> quite like uh, prison-like in some ways. Um, I would say go back to the basics. And in a lot of, uh, in a lot of um, cities and neighborhoods, there are spaces that are available to use or you can convince a municipal government to let like, agree to some things that you can realize there and in a lot of cases it's only like you know you're not you kind of don't expect to be able to do things in your city or you're not very motivated and with the children in the summer school we are trying to talk about that like there are op possibilities for you to enjoy uh, public space and potentially even build things that others can use uh it might not be like you know a full football pitch but it could be like a, a you know a weights with two three trunks on the two ends and uh, um, it is more about uh, coming together and sweating a bit rather than um rather than uh, kind of uh, measuring and competing and uh, recording uh, in that in this instance, um, yeah, I kind of lost my uh, train of thought. Towards <laughs> yeah, there. so it's like uh, what we're kind of interested in is that first step towards the um, sporting venues and like more reclaiming public space um, through DOI and kind of sporting facilities. Yeah, like for example, in this uh, abandoned football pitch that we showed, it would have been so easy just to get a lawnmower and like organize a schedule of, you know, who is kind of taking care of it, but it, something was kind of lacking there that obviously we couldn't solve. But just by putting these places on a map and initiating a discussion about them, it might have sparked something in the end about the local ruins in, um, in uh, Berlin. Thank you for your answers. I can actually uh, tell you a funny little story from uh from my time in Romania. So I'm actually one of the few people that follow all the football leagues from the fourth to the first, because it's funny occurrence and you can see new places and how the public administration works. 
there was this one time team that promoted into the second Liga and they were actually using cows to cut the grass on their own fields. That was the cutest thing I ever saw. And the cows were not impressed by any football running their way even when there was a match. People were like, we're going to siege Comuna Recha because that, sta- that little stadium is like a siege fortress. Like everyone knew where the hole in the grass was, they were avoiding it, and the other people were breaking their legs. <laughs> <laughs> well, but that is like a creative way to like go around it. And actually, I'm speaking which, um, the, maybe this is a bit off topic, but um, there's this place, um, Nida in Lithuania, and it has like, uh, it's kind of um, by the seaside and this kind of uh, natural um, sand dunes, and it had the problem with kind of yeah, various uh, plants overgrowing the sand dunes. So after various solutions that they tried and millions invested invested in it, they're actually trying now um, these goats that are uh, just let free to roam. And apparently sometimes they cross um, the border into Kaliningrad and they have to <laughs> contact the uh, border control <laughs> and say that um, there might be our goats <laughs> lost in your your Russian territory. Ah, so that's that sand strip from uh, Klaipeda, right? Yeah, yeah, that's like mm-hmm. a, this um, Kar- uh, Karolian spit. Yeah, thanks. Oh, that's a nice story. Yeah, I mean, the idea is not bad. In Germany here, where I'm currently studying, there's this um, communal um, sports teams and they work like charities. They are registered as charities, as football mm-hmm. clubs. Mm-hmm. And they have affordable... Uh, you can call it affordable entry fees, like 10 euros a month or something, and you can access it uh, like twice a week with professional training and their own equipment. Yeah. Like solution for once. And yeah, but it's always dependable on communal money. So if you don't have it, like that's the problem. Yeah. If you're a rich community, thank God. If not, then pray for European funds. <laughs> yeah. True, true. Great thread too. So thanks also Serban for your questions and stories. So I just wonder, should we, if we already move to this informal mode, so should we, should we just be um, finishing for, for today? And I think uh, at least uh, four of us who were just talking, uh, four of us who were just talking meeting in the Saginus in the uh, second half of uh, August. So we'll continue this. I have several more questions written down. I think it's easy to find Anna and Maria to those who have, who got interested in, in their work. I think uh, it's not a problem at all. So, so I just, from my side, I just want to thank everyone again to the speakers and also to everyone who was uh, listening to us, commenting and, and uh, sending questions. So I guess it's time to, to start saying bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for listening, and hope you have a nice evening. Thank you. Bye. Bye. See you all around. Thank you for all your input. It was really (laughs) interesting to hear. (laughs) Looking forward for more.